For those of you who are uh, keeping tabs, and as we're moving over into the next session, um, the Summers and Carvery cases have been uh, released by the Supreme Court of Canada. They dismissed the appeals, um, and so the exercise of discretion in the uh, Sentencing Act stands as I understand it. Um, no doubt uh, you can look at Twitter right now to get updates from a number of the people in the room, but the appeals were, uh, were dismissed at the Supreme Court of Canada. Yeah, every, and so you'll see in your packages you were handed an, on, on a, a, a sign-on for um, the Air York wireless network. Um, so you no doubt already know uh, how to do that. And, and thank you, um, uh, Bruce. Uh, we'll hand it over to you. Thanks so much, Ben. And it's uh, wonderful to see you all. And welcome to the first plenary panel uh, of the day on disappointments at the Supreme Court critical questions. My name is Bruce Ryder. I'm a member of the faculty here at Osgoode Hall, and I'm really delighted uh, to be here with you and with our distinguished panelists. You have the biographies of the panelists uh, accessible to you through the, the uh, conference website. So I don't want to take you through them. We have limited time this morning. We have 75 minutes for this panel. Each of the speakers is going to speak for 15 minutes. Let me just briefly uh, introduce each of our speakers. Professor Rosemary Cairnsway teaches criminal law, constitutional law, and legal theory at the Faculty of Law at University of uh, uh, Ottawa. She is going to be speaking to us uh, about about her paper, Deliberate Disregard, Judicial Appointments Under the Harper Government, and in examining the uh, disregard of diversity considerations in the federal judicial appointments process uh, over the course of the last few years. Professor Adam Dodek, who's sitting uh, next to me, is the Vice Dean of Research at the Faculty of Law at University of Ottawa, where he teaches public law and legislation legal ethics and professional responsibility, and a seminar on the Supreme Court of Canada. And Adam is going to be conducting a democratic audit in his remarks today and in his uh, uh, paper of the Supreme Court of Canada appointments since 2004. And finally, Professor Hugo Sear at my far right, uh, who teaches at the Faculté de Sciences Politiques et de Droit à l'Université du Québec à Montréal. Uh, where his research and teaching interests include constitutional law, constitutional theory, federalism, the relationship between domestic and international law, and legal theory. And uh, Hugo will be, teaching, will be speaking today about the bungling of Justice Nadon's appointment and the constitutional implications of the reference opinion recently released by the Supreme Court. So we have a wonderful panel ahead of us. Uh, we are, we'll start uh, with um, Professor Adam Dodek. Adam. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Bruce, and thank you to the organizers. It's an absolute pleasure to be here, especially with my colleague, Rosemary Cairnsway, and my uh, good friend and, and former co-clerk at the Supreme Court of Canada, Hugo Sear. Um, I absolutely love this conference, and I've had the, the good fortune to participate in a number of the conferences, and for me it really is a, a highlight of my academic year, which perhaps tells you about the lowlights in my personal and professional life. <laughs> but I was thinking ahead about this conference over a year ago, or, or just under a year ago, and I sort of thought, last spring or towards the summer that we had had 10, 2013 would mark 10 full years of changes to the Supreme Court appointment process and the time was ripe to really conduct a thorough evaluation of that. And I did what any good law professor would do, which is try and hire the smartest, best law student that you can to help you out. And so I just want to acknowledge Emily Alderson, my research assistant, who we've been working on this issue uh, for over the past year. And as it turned out, as we hear from Hugo, that events, I think, with the Nadon appointment really elevated the level of scrutiny about the appointment process. 
I would say that it's entirely appropriate that we are here in this room, in this law school, to reflect back upon the reforms to the Supreme Court appointment process. Because I think that in this room, that's where it all began in essence. In October 2002, Paul Martin, who had stepped down as finance minister, or fired, depending on one's perspective, effectively launched his campaign to lead the Liberal Party of Canada and to become Prime Minister with a speech here at Osgood Hall Law School. And at that speech, which made front page news the next day, he coined the term democratic deficit to describe what he saw as the deficiency in Canadian politics. He lambasted the PMO. We're not talking again about Pr Prime Minister Stephen Harper, of course. He was talking about the concentration of power in the Prime Minister's office of Jean Chrétien. And Paul Martin's Osgood speech became a key event in the democratic reform movement, something that he took from the Reform Party in the 1990s and 2000s. And the key line from that speech was, we need to move away from who you know into the, in the PMO to a more open political process. And the goals of that democratic deficit movement were about checking the power of the executive and empowering parliament. And in December 2003, Paul Martin becomes prime minister and he launches the most open and extensive discussions about the re reforming the Supreme Court appointment process in our history. And changes begin in earnest in the beginning of 2004 when suddenly and surprisingly, Louise Arbour, who had only been on the Supreme Court for five years, resigns to become UN High Commissioner, uh, UN President of the UN Human Rights Council, and Justice Iacobucci takes early retirement. That leads to a process that culminates in Justice Minister Erwin Kotler appointing uh, Louise Charon and Rosie Abella to the Supreme Court of Canada in August 2004, and for the first time, a Minister of Justice explaining the reasons why a Supreme Court judge was appointed. And so that period between 2004 and the end of 2013, we saw the most changes to the Supreme Court appointment process since the court was created in 1875. And I think standing here in 2014, post Nadon, is an opportune time to evaluate those changes. And in my paper and in this presentation, I evaluate them based on what those reforms were intended to accomplish. Now others, such as Rosemary, other scholars may look at other bases to evaluate appointments. What I'm trying to, to do in this democratic audit exercise is saying, what were these reforms intended to accomplish? Have they delivered on that? And I would say that there were three things that these reforms intended to accomplish. Transparency about opening up the process, so understanding how Supreme Court judges are appointed. Accountability, that check on executive power through empowering parliament. And finally, and I would say a little bit later to the game, the reforms were meant to be about giving the, a, a public education role, letting the public understand more about the work of the Supreme Court and about who these individual judges were that were going to be appointed to the Supreme Court and what exactly they did as Supreme Court judges. And I think importantly, what these reforms were not about were, they weren't supposed to be about getting better judges to the Supreme Court. They weren't supposed to be about trying to fix some perceived deficiency with the operation of the Supreme Court of Canada. So, as you're probably doing, looking at the judgments that just came out, you're, you're hopefully skipping to the last page so that at least you can sort of read it uh, by, by the time my presentation is finished so that you can pay full attention to the more interesting presentation of my colleagues. But if I skip to the end of my, the sort of bottom line, I would say that 
in terms of public information about the judges and the Supreme Court of Canada, I'd give that an A minus. Now, maybe some people might think I'd be a generous marker that we students would up to decide, but Peter Hogg, in reflecting on the Rothstein hearing, said that that hearing sent a reassuring message about the industry, ability, and integrity of the person about to join the court. And I think generally, the process has done extremely well on this, in this respect. On transparency, however, I would give the process a D. And on accountability, I would give it an F. So let me just say one quick additional thing about the public education role where I think the reforms have done well. I think that they've shown that judges are people too. They've demystified the process and the court. And I think that they've probably had the effect of strengthening the public perception of the Supreme Court of Canada and the people who sit on our highest court. And so therefore my focus today is really on the other two elements. On transparency first. For me, what I've learned from the Nadon uh, bungling, to use Hugo Sears term of art, is really how little we know about the process. And in fact, I sort of thought about this and said, well, we actually know more about how a pope is selected than how a Supreme Court justice is selected. And I did some research in preparation for this. There are actually written procedures set out by the Vatican for the selection of a pope. For the Supreme Court of Canada, there are no written procedures. As we'll hear, we know that Section 5 and Section 6 of the Supreme Court Act are very minimal in terms of the qualifications. All we've gotten from uh, the current government are four bullet points in every press release from 2011, 2012, 2013. And they are as follows. The selection process will be, to, uh, one, to identify a pool of qualified candidates for appointment to the Supreme Court of Canada, the Minister of Justice and Attorney General will consult with the Quebec Attorney General, as well as leading members of the legal community Members of the public are invited to submit their input with respect to qualified candidates, candidates who merit consideration at www.justice.gc.ca, etc. Two, the list of qualified candidates will be reviewed by a selection panel composed of five members of parliament, including three from the government caucus, one from each of the recognized opposition caucuses. Three, the Supreme Court selection panel will be responsible for assessing the candidates and providing an unranked short list of three qualified candidates to the Prime Minister and the Minister of Justice. Four, the selection nominee will appear at a public hearing of an ad hoc parliamentary committee to answer questions of members of parliament. The process was first established for the appointment of the Honorable Mr. Justice Rothstein in 2006. That's it. There are no timelines for any of this process. There are actually strict timelines in place for the selection of a pope, both for in terms of when the process starts and how votes are conducted. We know how you actually vote, not you, but how the, Cardinal, the, the, the College of Cardinals votes to select a pope. You require a two-thirds majority in order to be elected pope. We have no idea how the Supreme Court selection panel operates. Do they operate on consensus by majority vote? Do they require unanimity? We simply don't know. Interestingly, before the cardinals start their work, start voting to select a pope, they hear two sermons, one of which lays out the current state of the church and sets out the qualities needed for a pope to possess at that specific time. In our Supreme Court selection process, there are no known instructions given to the members of the selection panel, and there are no published qualifications as to what are the qualities necessary in order to be a Supreme Court judge. The one thing that the process, two processes do have in common are that both 
electors or selectors in both processes are required to sign an oath of secrecy. What we have in our process, as Dick Cheney would say, is we have a whole list of known unknowns. We know very little about how the process works. We don't know the criteria for selections. We know who's consulted, but we don't know the nature of those consultations. We don't know the role of the public and what that public input does. We don't know how the Minister of Justice prepares the so-called long list. We don't know how many names are on that long list. We don't know how the selection panel works. And that's why I give, I think we have a continued transparency deficit, and that's why I gave it a D for transparency. Turning next to accountability, the fundamental problem in accountability is accountability is about holding people to account for the exercise of power. When you don't have any of this transparency, knowing what they're supposed to be able, to, supposed to do, it's very hard to hold people to account. It's very hard, and again, this accountability is supposed to be about constraining the power of the executive. And I would say to you that the process that has been set up has actually been set up very well to not constrain the power of the executive very much at all. And actually, in terms of empowering parliament, to give parliament, parliament as an institution no power, no role, no voice, and to give individual parliamentarians very little impact in the uh, process. The so-called long list that the Minister of Justice submits is reportedly five to six names that the selection panel then winnows down to three. That's not a lot of surrendering of power in there. The, the selection panel, it's a closed list. They can't go beyond that. The public hearing, which is supposed to have a, a vetting function, has taken place in the Rothstein case on the most notice, four days notice, and the other hearings on two days notice. And I think what Rocco Galati in the Nadon case showed you is how ineffective the parliamentary hearing or the public hearing has been in terms of exercising any sort of vetting function. We're going to hear from, fortunately, we're lucky to hear from Dahlia Lithwick uh, after lunch. In the U.S., Senate is given at least four to six weeks notice of a prospective nominee. I can't imagine how the U.S. Senate would respond if a president attempted to give two days notice for a confirmation hearing. Lastly, there's, in my paper I talk about sort of three vignettes that to me show the absolute failure of accountability in this process. The first, in the Rothstein hearing, which is generally considered to be the best of the group, and in a sense we've gone sort of downhill from there. As I sort of went through the, the transcripts, I noticed something that I thought was an anomaly. In none of these hearings, as I'll talk about, the, is the Minister of Justice, the person actually exercising power on his behalf or on behalf of the Prime Minister, actually required to answer any questions. In the Rothstein hearing, one of the MPs actually asked Professor Hogg a question, which to me led to the question, what is this about? Is this an academic seminar like, like we're having now, which is very interesting, but is not an exercise in, maybe an exercise in powerlessness and futility, <laughs> but, or is this a, an attempt to hold public, people who exercise public power to account? The second thing was the well-known exchange between Joe Comartin and Justice Moldaver about Justice Moldaver's lack of proficiency in French. Now, I think it's entirely appropriate to ask Justice Moldaver, how can you be a Supreme Court justice when you don't speak or understand French? But I think it was completely hypocritical and misplaced for Joe Comartin to badger Michael Moldaver about his lack of proficiency in French because Joe Comartin served on the selection panel that allegedly unanimously recommended Michael Moldaver for inclusion on that shortlist. And it's Joe Comartin should, that should explain to his constituents and the Canadian people how he participated in a process and on what grounds he recommended to the Minister of Justice and the Prime Minister somebody 
who could not speak French. Lastly, in the hearing uh, for Justice Wagner, which I would describe either as a love-in or perhaps in a more technical use of the French language as a fluff fest, the MPs were falling over each other, complimenting Justice Wagner, who was a graduate of my law school of the University of Ottawa. And Francoise Boivin said, well, I am also a graduate of the great University of Ottawa. And then a member of the committee who went to McGill said, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about what a first class legal education I got at McGill University. <laughs> and the hearing ended with Rob Nicholson, the Minister of Justice who actually made the recommendation to the Prime Minister, not explaining why Justice, uh, why Justice Wagner would be a great Supreme Court Justice, but by simply saying, thank you, this has been great, and I am a graduate of the great Faculty of Law of the University of Windsor. So to me, the coup de grace was the Nadon hearing, which failed to flush out serious legal issue and left to Rocco Galati several days later to demonstrate that there was a serious legal problem here. And that's why I think in terms of accountability, the process is more than deficient, it's worse. It shifts accountability off the shoulders of the Minister of Justice and the Prime Minister onto the nominee. In the, if we have time in the question period, I'll tell you uh, recommendations that I have. I would just like to say that, you know, I'm tempted at this point to say, well, we should just scrap the whole process. And uh, my colleague, Charisma Mathen, in 2007 warned us, and she wrote, hasty and ill-conceived changes may prove impossible to reverse in the event that they make the current situation worse, not better. And I think in at least two respects, the changes have certainly made the process worse, not better. Happy to talk about further things in the question period, but I'm anxious to hear about what my other two colleagues have to say. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Adam. Now that we've heard about the maintenance of executive power in the appointments process to the Supreme Court of Canada, now we have the privilege of hearing from Professor Karen's way about how the executive has gone about exercising that power in relation to Supreme Court of Canada appointments and federal judicial appointments. Generally, you may have seen some of the highlights of Professor Karen, or lowlights perhaps, of Professor Karen's way's findings on the front page of the Globe and Mail yesterday and Sean Fine's article. We're now very fortunate to be able to hear more about uh, her research. Professor Karen's way. Thank you very much, Bruce. It's a, a pleasure to be here. Um, and a pleasure to follow uh, my colleague and friend Adam Dodek, and I'm looking forward to hearing Professor Sear as well. There's a remarkable uh, consensus in both academic and professional commentary about the need to change our judicial appointment process. Uh, most recently, in August of 2013, the CBA took a public stance on the lack of diversity in the federal judiciary, pointing out that the low number of women and members of racialized and other minority groups appointed to the federal courts does not not reflect the gender balance or diversity in the Canadian population. In January of 2014, the Law Society of British Columbia unanimously committed itself to be proactive in selecting a more diverse list of lawyers as the Law Society's candidates for appointment to the Federal Judicial Advisory Committees. The resolution was adopted in response to worrying appointment trends which had been identified by the Equ Equity Committee in British Columbia. The urgent need for Aboriginal judges has been pointed out by the CBA and the Indigenous Bar Association. And Chief Justice McLaughlin is on the record with respect to the importance of a judiciary that mirrors the public it serves. These calls for change have elicited no political response. Recent federal appointees appear to be, in as much as it is possible to discern from publicly available information, almost uniformly white. In addition, the range of professional experience in recent appointees is both limited and arguably skewed in a manner which reflects the government's criminal justice agenda. The Nadon fiasco provides an opportune moment to examine judicial appointments. 
I worry that the understandable public and intellectual preoccupation with the Supreme Court has the effect of distracting us from the just as significant implications of the government's approach to Section 96 appointments. Trial judges are the face of justice for ordinary Canadians, and the face they present is remarkably homogenous. This project started when I was asked, like many academics are, to comment on the appointment of Justice Nadon, and in preparing, I discovered some alarming statistics which were quite compiled by the Globe and Mail in April 2012. Uh, the article uh, examined 100 federal judicial appointments that had been made in the three and a half years prior to the 30th anniversary of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Of those 100 appointments, 98 of the appointees were white. This paper scrutinizes federal appointments made subsequent to April 2012. While I have no doubt that the individual men and women appointed to the federal bench are in good faith working to deliver justice to Canadians, I'm nevertheless of the view that individual good faith is an insufficient palliative to institutional inadequacy. In the brief time available to me, I want to speak about the primary arguments for diversifying the judiciary. I want to comment a bit on the Judicial Advisory Committee process and then describe what I discovered about the most recent federal judicial appointments with regards to their professional backgrounds and their race. I want to begin by acknowledging how complicated these questions are. I recognize how complicated they are. Unfortunately, at this point in time, we are very far from needing to engage in highly sophisticated analysis on the question. We're just nowhere near the point where the complicated questions even emerge. Two primary arguments support the call for increased judicial diversity. One is pragmatic and one is normative. All rest on the no longer controversial claim that judges are a product of their human experiences, that they bring those experiences with them to the courtroom, and that the exercise of judging, because it is infused with choice and requires the continuous exercise of discretion, judicial identity matters. The utilitarian argument in support of judicial diversity is simple. The more diverse the bench, the better the quality of judgment. Increasing the range of perspectives and experiences on the bench increases the likelihood of judgment which is truly impartial, which does not unintentionally replicate at a systemic level the perspectives and values of a limited subset of human experience. The power of this claim does not depend on essentializing the perspectives of a particular community. Rather, as others have argued, the real issue is proportional access to the channels of judicial decision decision-making and power so as to open up what has been heretofore an excessively constrained set of perspectives. We know that who participates makes a difference. This knowledge often translates into a claim that diversity of perspective is especially valuable at the appellate level. The self-evident truth of that claim doesn't diminish the significance of having a diverse and representative trial bench. While trial judges deliberate and act alone, they also form an intellectual and social community whose bonds are intensified by the social isolation which the role requires. It is important, I think, not to underestimate the significance of the coffee room, or more formally, the, the fact uh, that many Canadian judges will participate in professional and ongoing continu continuing education. Both of these contexts are enriched by exposure to diversity, and this point has been brought home to me personally in my work with judicial education when women judges describe the shift in conversational culture in the coffee room and the concomitant expansion of permissible points of view that tends to follow an educational exposure to diversity. The normative argument in favor of diversity reflects constitutional and democratic values which undergird our system, the norm of anti-discrimination and our commitment to judicial independence and impartiality. The claim here is that an unrepresentative judiciary demonstrates that the appointments process has disproportionately denied opportunities to indigenous peoples, racialized individuals, persons with disabilities, women, and other members of equality-seeking groups. A standard response identifies the pool problem as primarily to blame, suggesting that lack of representativeness reflects the nature of the pool of applicants and that demographic shifts will eventually trickle upwards to the judiciary. <laughs> 
While it's true that the pool problem may offer a partial explanation for current statistics, passivity in the face of a stubbornly homogenous bench is no longer constitutionally defensible. At the very least, we need to give careful and critical attention to the ways in which merit and professional competence are being evaluated. And the only way to do this is through informational transparency. Only knowing what is going on will allow us to develop the kinds of sophisticated remedial responses which are required. Non-discrimination is not the only constitutional norm at issue. It's been 15 years since the Supreme Court decided Gladue. And in that decision, they found that the overrepresentation of Aboriginal peoples in the criminal justice system qualified as a crisis. The likelihood of an Aboriginal person facing an Aboriginal judge remains unchanged. The number of federally appointed Aboriginal judges in Canada hovers at less than 1%. In my view, the jurisprudence on juror impartiality is relevant here. Recent cases about the constitutional dimensions of the right to a jury role compiled by a process ensuring inclusive representation of on-reserve Aboriginal peoples offers some fodder for an argument about the constitutional sufficiency of a selection process which seems resistant to diversity. I think that the continuing failure of the federal bench to offer institutional or structural impartiality to Aboriginal persons is inconsistent with the substantive equality guaranteed by Section 15, the independence and impartiality guaranteed by Section 11D, and more generally with unwritten constitutional norms related to democracy, the protection of minorities, and the rule of law. Now, I'm assuming that most of us know uh, a bit about the appointment of federal judges. Federal judicial appointments are managed by the Office of the Commissioner for Federal Judicial Affairs, which administers 17 judicial advisory committees responsible for evaluating candidates. The current advisory committee structure is heir to reforms initiated by the Mulroney government in 1988. And the reforms were intended to increase transparency in a manner that was consistent with judicial independence. The reality, I think, is quite different. The committees lack the capacity to do anything more than initial, an initial vetting of the candidates. As of March 2014, 74% of the committee members on the Judicial Advisory Committees were male. Three committees are currently all male. Concerns about the composition of the Judicial Advisory Committees reflects a legitimate apprehension about how they will interpret and apply their mandate. While professional competence and overall merit are the primary qualifications, committees are encouraged to respect diversity. They are asked to consult with the community and consult broadly. However, confidentiality makes it impossible to know whether these procedural ideals are implemented. The list of publicly available criteria for appointment has been described as a laundry list into which every conceivable consideration was inserted rather than a focused set of qualifications. While committees are enjoined to respect diversity, the goal of achieving diversity is nowhere to be found on the primary website of the Office of the Federal Commissioner. It does appear on the personal history form, which is accessed by hyperlink, which candidates are expected to fill out. And it reads as follows on page about eight, I think it is. Given the goal of ensuring the development and maintenance of a judiciary that is representative of the diversity of Canadian society, you may, if you choose, provide information about yourself that you feel would assist in this objective. There is no obligation to do so. No information related to that objective is publicly available, nor is any kept. And the complete lack of information makes accountability impossible, even with respect to the limited functions played by the committees. It's hard to disagree with the claim made by Dean Sawson that the committees serve an accountability function that they in fact have neither the authority nor the will to perform. Now I examined federal appointments made after that Globe and Mail article and up until March 7, 2014. There have been 94 initial appointments to the bench. I did not examine elevations from provincial courts or to appellate courts. In my paper, I look at gender, but uh, I, because of time limitations, I intend to focus only on the question of racialization and professional experience. As you may know, gender is the only characteristic tracked on the website. 
So as a result, there is a complete informational vacuum which confronts anyone who wishes to find out the kind of information I was interested in. The Globe and Mail relied on internet searches and information from judicial sources and law firms where judicial appointees worked for its statistics. I employed similar tools, but with deep misgivings. Clearly, relying on pictures or biographical information as a method of identifying ascriptive characteristics relevant to the question of representativeness is deeply unsatisfying and potentially inaccurate. However, the alternative seems equally unpalatable. It cannot be that the choice to withhold relevant information can stifle legitimate critique. In fact, one could argue that the deliberate provision of public information which renders identity invisible and which requires cautious reliance on potentially inaccurate or incomplete dat data is in itself suggestive of the government's interest in and commitment to diversity. I was able to identify only one racialized judicial appointee in the 94 I examined. 81 of the appointees appear to be white. For 12 of the appointees, I was not confident with the information I gathered to draw a conclusion. Accepting the Globe and Mail data as the starting point, this means that in the last approximately five years, three of the 182 federal appointees where a determination can be made based on publicly available information are not white. 179 are. Two are Métis and one is South Asian. This represents an appointment rate of 1.1% for Aboriginal judges and 0.5% for visible minority judges. I find this to be an appalling statistic. Data from the Household Survey in 2011 suggests that 19% of the Canadian population are visible minorities and 4.3% of the population are Aboriginal. While we know that the demographics of the profession do not match the demographics of the population, there is clear evidence that the profession is changing. And one doesn't need sophisticated statistical skills, which I do not have, to comment on what is obvious. The demographics of federal judicial appointments have failed to keep pace with the changing demographics of the profession, and they have utterly failed to keep pace with the changing demographics of the population. The committees are instructed to consider all legal experience, including that outside a mainstream legal practice. Now, recognizing that the boilerplate descriptions found on the Department of Judges, Ju Justice website will tend to mask professional backgrounds, it's nevertheless clear that certain profiles dominate. An astonishing half of the 94 appointees, or 47, were described uh, as either civil litigators or corporate commercial lawyers. 17 of the appointees specialized in criminal law, and 16 of those, or 94%, were Crown prosecutors. Notable by absence or omission were refer references to clinic experience, social justice work, human rights, or public interest advocacy. Now, there are two comments to make about that. The first is these announcements are very different from what we see in the so-called committee hearings, where we hear of parents who were hockey players and professional singers, summer work on road gangs, and the value of the immigrant experience. The underlying message is that judging is about more than professional expertise, it's about understanding difference. Unfortunately, there's no way to assess the human qualities we value and the human qualities which we recognize as essential to the capacity to judge from the information provided to the public. Second, despite the informational inadequacies of these descriptors, common sense tells us that recent federal judicial appointees are remarkably homogenous. Retired Justice Donna Martinson has adverted publicly to the risk of discriminatory outcomes for women and vulnerable peoples when judicial appointments appear to overprivilege certain professional experience. Her concern was with family law, but I think the same thing can be said with respect to criminal law. It's hard to resist the conclusion that the overwhelming preference for Crown prosecutors in federal judicial appointments reflects the government's current agenda, an agenda which was overtly reflected in the addition of a law enforcement representative to the JACs in 2006, and which the Prime Minister has specifically spoken of. Uh, in conclusion, when I was doing this work, a bunch of things happened. The Dada decision appeared, and um, Vic Tave was appointed to the Manitoba uh, Court of Queen's Bench. And 
The response to this uh, nomination or appointment has been, I think, characteristically from legal professionals, relatively gentle and, in fact, quite polite. Uh, one lawyer who had represented clients of adversely affected by some of his political decisions said, one hopes that in his judicial persona he finds a way to be judicial, to consider all sides and ensure fairness. I think the time has come to stop being polite. I agree with Professor Jamie Cameron, who said when she was asked about the Nadon appointment that she was abandoning her usual policy of no comment because <laughs> she, she, she believed that the appointment reflected the Prime Minister's lack of respect for the Supreme Court as an institution. In my view, the Harper record of superior court appointments is just as disrespectful of the institutional integrity of the federal judiciary. Although the lack of transparency makes it impossible to be certain, the evidence suggests that representativeness is not only being ignored, but it is being consciously ignored. And the result of, of that deliberate disregard is the maintenance of a status quo, which is impossible to justify. In my view, the continuing lack of diversity on the bench threatens the capacity of Canadian courts to deliver impartial justice in a time of rapid change, increasing diversity, and mounting inequality. We all deserve better. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rosemary. The problems in the federal appointments process that Rosemary has identified and the problems with the Supreme Court of Canada appointments process that, that Adam spoke to us about are obviously part of the reason why we ended up having the Justice Nedon fiasco and here to speak to us about it and the opinion it produced and the constitutional implications of that opinion is Professor Hugo Sear. Hugo. Well, thank you very much. Uh, yes, indeed, the, the uh, preliminary title of my paper is The Bungling of Justice Nadon's Appointment and its, and its Constitutional Consequences, and I think I'm going to stick to that title uh, because the uh, bungled process that has uh, led to Justice Nadon's appointment might have hurt the public confidence in the court. It positively certainly hurt Justice Nadon. But I would like to highlight also how unilaterally trying to modify the Supreme Court Act resulted in negligently jeopardizing the necessary flexibility required in our cooperative federation. In my mind, this brash move by the Harper government fits right in with the attitude to federal-provincial relations that have led to the Senate reference and to the Quebec's challenge to the abolition of the gun registry that will be heard by the Supreme Court uh, soon. Cooperative federalism and fo federal solidarity require that uh, one government does not treat the others as foreign states. When governments forget this, the Supreme Court seems willing to offer it a reminder in the form of newly discovered entrenched obligations. Such entrenched constitutional obligations, for example, like the Constitutionally Requirement Committee between provinces, have the benefit of ensuring some minimal amount of cooperation and adding some protection to, the, to one party or another against the actions of its partners. But as in the case of the entrenchment of the Supreme Court and its composition, it, um, such newfound constitutional requirements may heavily constrain the ability of future governments to find flexible cooperative solutions to their mutual needs. So what happened here? On April 22nd, the Honorable Justice Morris Fish wrote to the Prime Minister um, to advise him that he would be retiring effective August 21st. That should not have been a surprise for the government since at the latest he was due to retire in November. Despite the fact that the government had, pre had a sufficient notice, only one week before the fall term was about to begin did the government announced that um, Justice Marc Nadon, he, and now you'll have to excuse my English because this is a word I cannot pronounce in English, 
juge super surnuméraire, supernumerary <laughs> judge, those nasty R's in English, I, I, of the federal court, was the nominee. Justice Nadon had been a member of the Quebec Bar from 1973 to 1993, and had been practicing maritime law. He was appointed to the federal court in 1993, so six months prior to the entry into force of the new Civil Code of Quebec. The government knew that appointing a federal court judge might have been a problem. The Justice Minister, right in the middle of August, acknowledged uh, as much in an interview to the National Post. Actually, they were worried so much about it that they took the special step of requesting an opinion to uh, retired Justice Ian Beeney on the issue. And not only did they take that extra step, but they had the opinion uh, reviewed by um, Peter Hogg and the uh, retired Justice Charon. Justice Beeney concluded that um, there was no problem under Section 5 to appoint a uh, federal court judge to the Supreme Court. Section 5, which reads, any person may be appointed a judge who is or has been, is or has been a judge of a superior court of a province or a barrister or advocate of at least 10 years standing at the bar of a province. But then the more complicated question was Section 6. Section 6, which the title of the rubric in French is interesting because it's not exactly the same as in, in English. In, in English, it says three judges from Quebec. The French title is more telling. It's called Représentation du Québec, <laughs> which is not exactly the same thing. So that it reads, at least three of the judges shall be appointed from among the judges of the Court of Appeal or of the Superior Court of the Province of Quebec, or from among the advocates of that province. Now, Justice Beeney's opinion spent most, um, of, most of the analysis dealt with Section 5, and it ended up being um, more or less suggesting that Section 6 um, had to receive uh, the same interpretation. Now, the government hope that by announcing Justice Nadon's appointment and publicizing those opinions, which is an, ex a, a, an extraordinary step in itself, should put to rest the contra controversy. They hope that only, ed um, they hope that only eggheads like me <laughs> would care. Well, that's only going to be interesting for a few constitutional law professors who no one listens to anyway. And, to be frank, they were already in battle with some Senate issues at the time. So maybe they thought, well, that, that's only going to find its way on page 17 of a newspaper for one or two days, and that should go away. Unfortunately for them, it didn't. And it could have been expected, and it wasn't wise for them to act that, to act that way. A much wiser course of action, if they truly wanted to appoint Justice Nadon, would have been to do the following. They knew that Justice Lebel is going to retire in November. So two seats from Quebec were going to be available in a very short period of time. So they should have filled Justice Fish's seat with someone else. In the meantime, they could have done two things. They could have, A, tried to discuss with provinces, see if they could find some agreement, Possibly not. <laughs> they, could have ref they could have had the reference to the Supreme Court before appointing Justice Nadon, and then get the answer whether or not it was valid. And then to be sure of their answer. And if the court said yes, Section 6 allows it, then when Justice Lebel retires, you appoint Justice Nadon. Not a very complicated set of things to do. But that was bungled. That's not the way they, they went ahead. They just rushed through and appointed um, Justice Nadon. So there were different steps along the way where the government could have said, well, let's put the brakes here, stop, and see what could be done to avoid um, making more problems. 
So this is the first step. The first step here, they should have stopped before appointing him, making sure that the rules were okay. I mean, I have the greatest respect for Justice Beeney. I have very little choice. He was my boss as a clerk. <laughs> but frankly, um, I agree with his analysis of Section 5. And whether or not I agree, that doesn't matter. But I mean, if you want to be sure, don't ask a retired judge. Ask the court, which is not retired yet. <laughs> because their opinion is binding. Well, we can have a discussion about references, whether or not they're binding, but... So, then they rushed into this very short process of appointing Justice uh, Nadeau. I won't get into all the details, because Adam did um, look at them. Um, one point, so on October 3rd, by order and counsel, Justice Nadeau was officially named Supreme Court judge and was sworn in on October 7. On the very same day, a few hours later, Toronto lawyer Rocco Galati uh, launched a challenge to this appointment. At that very moment, it should have been clear that something wrong was going on with this appointment. Something terribly wrong had happened with this appointment. And it was way too late to call off the appointment because he was already sworn in. And there's obviously no way to, to impeach him once he's sworn in. Scholars were very quickly busy at looking at whether or not uh, the appointment was valid. So um, among the first one, I, I have to say, Paul Daly's blog on October 9 did a, a very interesting uh, study of the history of Section 5 and 6, but I think uh, Michael Paxton and Carissa, Carissima Matten's paper has to be uh, pointed uh, forcefully because on October 23rd, okay, just less than a week, or just about a week after uh, the appointment, they, they had already this paper uh, looking at uh, the validity, and that's, that's amazing. That was a really a strong paper. But you can say, well, the, this, the, the process had failed, but you know, it was still maybe salvageable somehow. But I think what really was a fatal blow of, to the process was that the Quebec government itself on October 17 declared that it was not happy with the appointment, actually opposed it, and was starting to look for ways to challenge it. Now, remember what I said about the title in French of Section 6? Représentation du Québec. When the Quebec government itself is challenging the appointment of the person who's supposed to be the représentant du Québec, you have a problem here. Now, to solve this problem, very quickly, the government decided to do what it should have done earlier, to uh, make a reference to the Supreme Court, to ask whether or not Section 5 and Section 6 allow for federal court uh, judges to be appointed, but then added another mistake to an already bungled process. They decided to, mod to include two new sections to the Supreme Court Act, modifying the Supreme Court Act, not in a, different, in a separate law, but in a uh, Christmas tree bill. I call Christmas tree bills something that is different from an omnibus bill. Omnibus, omnibus bill, you know, you put all sorts of things together and you know, bundle it and you know, you vote on it. Christmas tree bills are more interesting because they're financial bills, budgetary bills. So they raise issues of confidence. So you put something that has nothing to do with financial uh, issues into something that is raising confidence in, and basically people cannot really vote on, on the substance independently. So why is it a mistake to include those two, what they call declaratory sections that were meant to clarify section five and six. Well, it was a big problem because, and they've been told, they've been warned, they've been advised by, publicly by witnesses in uh, standing committees studying the bill, that there was a risk that such sections would be declared unconstitutional. <laughs> 
there was a risk that the court might say, we disagree with your reading of section five and six. Therefore, we need to look at those extra clauses that you want to add to the Supreme Court Act. Why is that a problem? It is a problem because if they do so, they might actually decide that the actual composition of the court is entrenched, something we didn't know before. It was unclear. Why is it a problem? Well, until you, you know that the, the composition of the court and the court itself is entrenched, you still can negotiate between provinces and the government, find sub-constitutional agreements, arrangements, so that everyone can um, uh, fulfill their needs, right, without going in ballistic. But once it is entrenched, then you have to follow all the formal rules, and it gets much more complicated to cooperate among uh, the actors, right? And it will raise all sorts of questions like, well, if the Supreme Court is entrenched, what is entrenched in the Supreme Court, right? What are the limits of the things that are entrenched and what are the things that the parliament will be able to play with? And what does it mean to, by composition? Is it all eligibility criteria that are entrenched or only a minimal set and so on? When those comments were made to the standing committee, um, the, uh, many MPs, uh, as grown-ups, laughed at the uh, people who made those suggestions. I'm not gonna be saying, I told you so. I'm not gonna be saying this. That's not in my nature. But I told them so. <laughs> and what was expect, what could have been expected to happen actually happened. And now we're stuck with this decision. Now this decision raises a number of problems. One, the, the court is now entrenched. It has been entrenched not by any amending formula, right, but by some form of incidental entrenchment through adoption of the charter and the abolition of the uh, uh, appeals to the Privy Council. So now we have this new doctrine of constitutional entrenchment that does not depend on any formal changes to the Constitution. And now we know that Part 5 of, sec of Constitution Act 1982 is not exhaustive. What is exhaustive is the Constitution of Canada, and apparently in the Constitution of Canada, we have such a, kind of, such a rule that allows for entrenchment that has nothing to do with formal entrenchment. Fine. Now, what is entrenched in the composition of the court? Eligibility criteria? How about language skills? Are they part of eligibility criteria? Is the composition that is entrenched a minimal set of criteria? Or is it the maximal set of criteria that can be entrenched uh, in any bill? My impression is that what is entrenched now is a minimal set because the, 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 the current Supreme Court Act, for example, does not mention that you have to be a Canadian citizen or that, uh, that you have to know how to read or that you're mentally sane or um, that you're not a serial killer to be appointed to the Supreme Court. And I think those would tend to be not non-controversial criteria to, to appoint someone on the Supreme Court. Right? So I think we could have new ones. But then there will be the issue of um, what is the, the essential features of the court that are now entrenched. Now, nine judges, three from Quebec, are entrenched. If we want to change the, uh, the, the way to appoint judges, before this decision, we could have had an agreement between the federal government and the provinces to, find, to put in place legislatively something like the Meech Lake Accords project of uh, having provinces negotiate. Now it's unclear whether or not we can do it. Would it be allowed to abolish reference powers? Would it be allowed to say um, only a special section of the court will hear in final appeal civil law cases? And so on. I mean, there, so basically, I, and I'm, I'm concluding here, and I'll be happy to discuss uh, language questions, but
basically, unilateral action in a, in a federation here forced the court, who sees itself as the guardian of the Constitution, but as the, also as the guardian of federation, to develop or to create new standards to protect parties because they were not respecting one another sufficiently. I think it would be much better for our federation to try to, be, to have a bit more mutual respect in our respective actions. Same thing for provinces. And we would allow such uh, inconvenience in the future. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Hugo. We now have 15 minutes for, for discussion with the panelists. Um, I imagine there are a few thoughts and opinions, comments and questions in this room on the topics that have been addressed in the papers. So please don't be shy, don't be too polite. Uh, step forward to the microphones and if you could briefly introduce yourself to the room, I'd appreciate it. Thank you very Hi, much. Hi, uh, Lisa Kerr, New York University. So a question for Adam Dodek. I obviously agree with many of the points you raise about accountability concerns in Canada, but I heard this hint of admiration for the US in your remarks. And um, I just wanted to say that we should really hesitate before even thinking about modeling the US on these issues. Um, I think historically in the US, the big problem was politicization, but now it's actually that Obama really can't get judges confirmed now. There are 65 vacancies in the federal district court. There's a 10% uh, level of vacancy. And, um, and it's, of course, a reflection of the sort of general levels of polarization in American politics. Um, and, you know, the reason they can't go on two days' notice is because they have an absolutely insane process of vetting at the White House and at the Senate committee review stage. Um, and then even when they do succeed in getting judges confirmed, it's very problematic. Of course, we saw on the sort of lesser end of the problematic scale, Justice Sotomayor have to um, you know, ascribe to some unrecognizable level of legal positivism in her remarks, um, saying that law is nothing more than calling balls and strikes. Or, or at the other end of the spectrum, you have Justice Thomas basically getting destroyed uh, before putting him on the bench. And I'm not saying that wasn't warranted, but it was a little bit of a strange thing to do before putting someone on the bench. I would certainly agree with the concerns that you've raised. The, what I would say is, first of all, the, there's a major difference in that the, under the U.S. Constitution, the Senate has a constitutional role in the appointment of, ju of judges, right? Uh, under the, the Canadian Constitution, Parliament of Canada does not, and for the reasons that, that Hugo mentioned, is unlikely ever to have that. My point is, is merely that let's not pretend that our parliament is going to be involved in any sort of serious way, not necessarily in a confirmation way, but in any sort of serious vetting way. It is, take Justice Nadeau, a man of 40 years experience, 20 years at the bar, 20 years on the federal court. The idea that there could be any serious review of somebody's career record with two days notice is a farce. So either take it seriously or not. Were there, what, there wasn't much of a record, really, there, was there? Um, <laughs> <clears throat> David Schneiderman, University of Toronto. Just a, a response to Lisa's um, it, uh, uh, comments about the U.S. Senate confirmation hearings and the false view of judicial decision-making. Uh, the judges call balls and strikes. Every one of the Harper nominees have done precisely that, have, have telegraphed that message right? I apply law, do not make it. Every single one of them. Now, that was a great panel, and I apologize, but I have a question for Adam as well. Um, so, thanks to everyone. Um, and it's about your grading policy. Um, and I wasn't, uh, uh, as my students say, I was confused. Um, you gave um, the uh, Harper government an A- minus on the public education role, yet you complained about the fact that there's really no um, uh, instruction about the law and about legal issues and about how judges decide cases. You assimilated that discussion under accountability. Did I get that right? Um, and I wondered why you did that, because it seems to me that the public education function is precisely that, um, uh, engaging Canadians um, and enhancing their literacy about constitutional decision-making. And it seems to me that the confirmation hearings have entirely failed on that front. 
rightly, as you've rightly pointed out. But that would lower your public education grade substantially, it seems to me. And I wanted to know, in that regard, what you might think about uh, judges' discussions about past precedent. And that is not their own decisions, which uh, Peter Hogg advised, uh, recommended to the committee that they not ask uh, nominees about, and his successor, uh, uh, Maitre Baudouin, also advised them not to do. But there was no direction about past Supreme Court precedent, for instance. Um, and I'm wondering what you might think about that, which is actually a feature in U.S. Supreme Court nomination hearings, a very substantial portion of the question and answer uh, um, uh, uh, sessions are about past Supreme Court precedent and the nominee's understanding of that. Thanks. Two great questions. Thank you, David. Uh, first of all, on the, uh, I think your criticisms of, you know, my grading policy or my grade are, are well taken and certainly I, I don't take, my personal thing is I don't take personal offense if a student appeals a grade to the examinations committee, so I certainly don't. I, I think those are, those are fair criticisms. What I would simply say is that in terms of actually learning about the work that, that judges do and learning something about the actual people, that that aspect has accomplished far more than the other two. Now, you might think that it doesn't deserve the grade I get, maybe I was too generous, points well taken. In terms of the discussion of precedent, I think it would be entirely appropriate for a judge to give their views on how the Supreme Court should deal, how it should revisit precedents, because that's, that's certainly an area of law, an area of doctrine as to approach a, to, to decision making that I think, I personally think is very unclear at the Supreme Court. Um, it, and it, there's an ad hoc nature to it. If you look at the discussion um, in Fraser after BC Health Services or in Bedford, that's really about doctrine rather than would you overrule, was this case wrongly decided? It's about an approach to decision making that I think that, that you have fairly identified as um, something that judges in Canada have been hesitant to get into. Um, it's more like a comment and a, a question on Adam, uh, Adam's paper. Um, don't get me wrong, I, I don't mind being harsh in criticizing uh, things that I find uh, not appropriate. Um, but I think you might have been a bit harsh on Joe Comartin uh, because for two reasons. One, you said that the decision was unanimous and what we know is coming from the PM's office and the Prime Minister's office was not privy to the confidentiality agreement that was signed by the members. So maybe it was true, maybe it's not. The same thing happened uh, with Justice Nadeau. Currently, the Prime Minister's office is declaring that the issue was not raised by the committee. We cannot know because it's a there is a confidential confidentiality agreement that prohibits members to discuss what happened during that uh, committee. And even if it were the case, because the as you said, the committee cannot look outside of the long list. So if out of six candidates, four were unilingual anglophones, then uh, the members of the committee whose mandate is to give three names might not have had any other choice, but including someone who was unilingual. So in that sense, I think those comments could still be fair. I'm gonna stand by my comments because I, I think I've been quite strongly critical, uh, and I believe rightly so, of the government, but I think that the opposition parties equally deserve criticism for participating in a deeply flawed process, and to me it makes absolutely no sense to have the same members on a so-called vetting committee questioning um, a nominee that they themselves selected. Uh, that makes no sense whatsoever to me. Chrisma. Uh, Carissima Mathen from the University of Ottawa. So my question could go to anyone on the panel. Um, so every justice minister who's been asked has insisted that section 96 and 100 of the Constitution Act 1867 absolutely preclude any substantive role for the legislative branch in appointments. Now I've always read that as drastically over, overstate, radically overstated, and I actually agree with Peter Hogg that says you, you really have to twist the meaning of, of the, the actual appointment power in that way. 
But um, it seems to me that what the past few years have shown, and this is an argument that I made in 2007, is that unless you're going to give the legislative branch actual input, there is no point bringing them to the table. It just creates, the, it just creates um, a sham process that uh, really doesn't advance anything. But now I'm curious whether the Supreme Court's uh, reading of the constitutional status of, of the Supreme Court can be read to extend to what appointment means in terms of both federal, both Section 96 courts and indeed now the General Court of Appeal. And we see a similar kind of question coming up in the Senate Act, but there, in the Senate reference, but of course appointment there has very different kinds of, uh, kinds of considerations. So I was just wondering whether you think that we now are faced with more constraints than even were there before because of the combination of the Nadeau references analysis plus sections 96 and 100. Okay. Well, um, that's a great question. And just by looking at the uh, Supreme Court reference, I'm, I'm not sure that we're constrained on, on this issue currently. But I think the, the Senate reference will basically tell us a lot about what, is it, what it means for appointments to happen. And um, I agree with uh, Adam on the, the principle that the, I was just a comment on this, but the rest I agree with. with this. And I think that um, having those public appointments, uh, hearings, um, when you say you, you qualify them as a sham, I think it's, it's actually dangerous for the uh, judicial system in itself because it gives uh, elected officials some incentives to point to the type of judge they will appoint to, as a gift to their base. Because if, if you can make a show out of the type of judge you're appointing, you're actually giving something to your base. And that's dangerous to politicize the judiciary. I would just say very quickly, I think that there's still room to give Parliament a voice in the process, not necessarily a veto. And we've seen in many other constitutional areas where, ways in which the, the government has said, we will not, um, say, the, the constitutional veto. We will, we, will not introduce, we will not exercise our constitutional power un unless we have this support from another jurisdiction or unless the support of Parliament. I am Caroline Voisard from uh, Quebec government, from the inter intergovernmental, -govern another <laughs> difficult word, <laughs> affairs. Um, my question is for Hugo Cyr or for the other panelists about uh, language issues at the Supreme Court or even uh, minority representation um, in relation to the um, majority uh, judgment of, uh, the, in the reference in for section 41, section 42. Uh, thank you. At first, I thought the decision was really going to hurt the possibility of, of such bills that were presented uh, on requiring judges to be bilingual in order to do their job. And after thinking about it a bit more, I, I'm not sure. I don't think it's going to hurt this possibility. And here are the reasons. I think the, the eligible, eligibility... I don't know what's happening this morning, but uh, those words... Ah. <laughs> The criteria to appoint someone <laughs> set out in the composition of the court are minimal criteria. They're not the maximum level. So I, I think you can add other ones without necessarily uh, limiting unless it really changes the nature of the composition. And that, that would... Second thing is I think uh, one can say that any of statute that would declare that bilingualism is a requirement might be argued to be purely declaratory in the following sense. It might actually be an implied uh, uh, requirement of the rule of law that judges be able to read both languages. And um, the Supreme Court reference in itself is a good example of that because in that reference, the court has to look at both French and English versions of the text. And it says explicitly that the rule of interpretation is you have to look at both versions and see if there is a co commonality. And if one is clearer, you have to choose the common intention, a common meaning that is clear. So unless you're able to read both versions, you cannot apply this rule. It would be like asking a judge to rule on 
a case that was decided and written entirely in, in Mandarin, for example. If you don't read Mandarin, you cannot look at the arguments and the reasoning. So rule of law might require you to be able to look at the law, not half of the law. Someone might say, well, if you have to choose between a Oliver Wendell Holmes and someone who's just a qualified judge, which one would you would choose? And my answer is, no Oliver Wendell Holmes would only be able to read half of the law. And uh, so that's, that's one thing. The other one out of rule of law principle might be that uh, you, you have the right to be heard. Now, uh, facta are not translated, and the Quebec government's facta are always in French. So it would mean that you know, those facta cannot be read by the judge. And the, the Court of Appeal of Quebec are usually, uh, decisions are usually written in French. So anyway, there, there's a series of other arguments that I, I don't have time to, but I think the decision does not close down uh, this option. Um, just quickly, I, I was too busy reading boilerplate descriptions of federal appointees to think really closely about this, but it seems to me there's a legitimate question about the claim that we need to have an indigenous seat on the Supreme Court and how that would fit yes. into the, uh, the yes. analysis. And as I say, mm -hmm. I haven't thought about it enough, but I think it's a really interesting and open question. Yes. I'm so sorry we're out of time. It would be wonderful to be able to continue the conversation with the panelists, but I want to thank them for three terrific presentations. If you haven't had a chance to read the papers on the, on the conference website, I commend them to you. They, they each make wonderful contributions. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. yeah no, I know.